Hi everybody, it's Lisa Marie again here with my Martini Talks and one of my very best friends, Erin. Good afternoon, Erin. How are you? I'm good. Good. We are not having martinis today. We're having good old fashioned H2O because it's hot as Hades in Houston, Texas and it's getting ready to pour down rain and it's humid and we've been fighting skeeters all afternoon too. So we're just going to sit down and have an old fashioned sit down visit and uh, not try to worry about our martinis until later on in the evening when it gets a little bit dark and hopefully a little bit cooler. So we were just talking about all of the stuff that we've been doing and working on ourselves, trying to get to be better human beings. And we thought we would just share and let you kind of listen in on that conversation. And that's part of what Martini Talks is all about anyway. So um, Aaron, talk to me a little bit about all the stuff that you've been working on and your self-improvement and being aware and all of that kind of stuff. You've been working on that for quite a while. Yeah, um, probably about five, six years now. Mm -hmm. Um, what so, started it? What kind of instigated it for you? Actually, I, I think what instigated it for me was I felt very uncertain in this life about just everything that was going on within work and some family dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I didn't personally like feeling that way. So I started working with different coaches and looking into chakra clearing and energy clearing and just what I could do for myself to just feel better about life in general. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's where that all started. Well, it's you there. know, one of the things that I've discovered just recently, and it's not something that I discovered, but it's something that I kind of become more aware of. And I'll be at some of it because of Uncle Brian, my husband, you guys know we all find Uncle Brian. Um, kind of poking fun at me about buying all this food and planting all these vegetables and doing all this stuff is my need to control. Yeah. And I really think that a lot of that stems from mom getting killed when I was little. I think mm -hmm. that that's sort of one of those things that I didn't really address as a child. I mean, it's kind of hard whenever you don't go to therapy to work on that kind of stuff. And then when you do go to therapy, you kind of figure out stuff that you might not have known was there. But a lot of the stuff that I've done has all been sort of self self done like self improvement mm -hmm. self through books and of course i got my degree in psychology to fix probably somewhere psychologically in my sublingual to try to figure out maybe i don't know what happened how it happened how i processed it and that sort of thing but it's interesting as adults how things that we had happen to us as kids stays with us mm -hmm. and it doesn't just go away i mean even if you work through it it doesn't always go away it's still with you it's just with you in a more aware type situation yeah. you know so what's the what's the sort of most revealing thing that you've been able to discover through chakras and well why don't you tell me more about that we've talked a little bit about that we have actually talked about it some um i think for me when i first started working with my own chakras it was a little difficult actually at first because i didn't really understand it completely mm -hmm. but and there are still some days where I feel like I have some blockages within certain, like the sacral, which is in your stomach, or I don't think I've ever had a problem with my heart chakra, but I think if any of them are blocked, it, it, it does create like a hard way for it to just come through. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really do believe that we are connected completely to everything around us. So if you have an open channel that's coming through your root and all the way up through your third eye and out your crown, then I, I mean, it's an energy flow to where if you always have that going, it's a lot easier to just stay balanced and to create less anger in yourself, a lot less emotion. Um, emotions are great. We all have them. But if you're not relying or reacting to them all the time, it just seems like life is a little bit, it flows a lot easier. The reaction is the biggie. Because yeah. I remember whenever I was a teenager, I was always reacting and was hot, quick hot tempered me too that would just you could set me off if you knew the button to push you could push the button and boy i would just take off and just go 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 and lose control and then you know end up having to say a lot of us i'm sorry and all that kind of stuff but as i've gotten older and a lot of it i just chalked up to being older you know is part of it probably is being older but a lot of it's being wiser too and just being more aware of when to react and what's worth reacting to and what's worth two seconds of your attention and just let it go because it's not going to be a big deal. You can't change it anyway. It's like mm -hmm. trying to make everything perfect is not the way the world works. So you might as well just figure out what you want to make perfect and let everything else 
just keep doing the way it's doing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's the main exactly. thing. So we were talking about chakras. Tell me through. Walk me through that. Walk me through how they work. You've got the heart. You've got the gut. You have your root, which is red. I'm gonna forget one by the way. Um, your sacral, your heart, your throat chakra, your third eye chakra, and then your crown is at the top. And if you can get all of them open, I mean, you can. You could probably just sit in meditation for days and not be, I mean, you would be aware of everything that was going on around you, but fully connected. Mm -hmm. it, it's a hard state to get into. I don't know that I've ever actually done it myself where I've been fully open because, I mean, we do. We live life every single day. There's distractions. There's everything else. But I just noticed within myself that I try to keep these channels open within myself. I, I'm just a lot more accepting of life in general. And others and others mm -hmm. so so where do you start like if somebody was just trying to figure out like where to begin do you begin with one specifically or is it just whichever one you feel like you're having trouble with? I actually started by reading books you can get ch chakra books anywhere on Amazon even um, okay. just go learn about your chakras but if you like feel like say it's kind of veering off into a different subject I have a feeling but Root chakras will affect sexuality sometimes. Okay. So if you have low libido or, you know, you're not feeling very sexy with your spouse or your significant other, imagine as if you had like a light pouring into your root chakra to clear it out. I mean, that's really all this work is. is if you just sit there and think about certain lights hitting certain parts of your chakra mm -hmm. and imagining opening them up, you can actually feel them open up. You just have to be aware of it. And I just, you know, a lot of people aren't aware that they're actually within our bodies. So. Right. Well, I've read a little bit about it. I haven't done a lot of work with it, but I've read a little bit about it. And mine started actually with all my food allergies. Yeah. And so, you know, I was really sick. And, you know, I started interviewing the chefs and I had that mm -hmm. food column. And I was interviewing all these guys and they're cooking with all this stuff. And I got really, really sick. Mm -hmm. And figured out that I had a lot of food allergies that we just never diagnosed mm -hmm. and then I started reading about that in terms of the gut and the clearing of the gut and trying to figure out what what to do to try to be more healthy in that way because when your body feels like crap you, you know you're just sick and you're not absorbing any of your nutrients because your gut's messed up you know that it's, affects it's hard, everything it's really hard to balance yourself I mean and, and your gut health is actually that is a physical thing so that's another important part of energy work if you're keeping your body cleaner and trying to take the right supplements and things to where you can actually let your body heal itself it's a lot easier to do energy work as well because you're right when you feel just crappy all the time it's a little it's, it's difficult it's like if you don't get any sleep yeah it's it's more difficult to connect to the world when we're feeling tired or anxious or if our stomach is bothering us or and you know that's a lifelong process with our bodies and what I've tried to do too is figure out isolate what it is I'm allergic to mm -hmm. and then stay away from it like you know Victorian has those food allergies that she's had since she was a baby and I would do the same thing with her I would give her like carrots for a week and if there's no reaction to carrots then carrots went on the good list yeah. and if she had a reaction to whatever it was and that went on the no-no list and for six months she didn't get to have it and even now at 22 she's allergic to peas and nuts still shellfish still a lot of times dairy will make her not feel good and make her tummy upset but um if you can get yourself in a good spot health wise then it's a good time to kind of do a refresh reset and start working on the other which yep. is more of your mental the chakras feel, i feel like to me maybe that's wrong but i feel like that's kind mm -hmm. of the next step is to try to get healthy with what you're doing what you're putting in your body mm -hmm. once you're feeling good and you're sleeping good and everything's sort of going not that everything has to be perfect before you start working because if it wait for that to happen you might be waiting you forever. might be wait forever you exactly. won't get to work on your chakras exactly yeah. so something they can go hand in hand you can do both at the same time so. yeah so do you do morning work or do you meditation what is it that you sort of do each day to kind I of usually try to do it in the mornings but i have i have a pretty strong habit of doing it at night actually right before i go to bed That's so, a good idea. yeah so what does it look like to you is it does it for me it's just sitting in a quiet place even if it's just laying on my bed right before i go to sleep um i have noticed if i can clear my mind of like the day's activities mm -hmm. through some meditation i'm not the best at meditation i actually kind of suck at it to be honest well and i do too 
because um, my brain it's it's Always constantly. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've found through honestly talking to a lot of people, you don't have to be completely quiet to meditate. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be sitting there and me, me and you have my conversation. I'm not meditating right now, but right. your brain doesn't have to be completely quiet for you to actually reach meditation state. It just doesn't. There's lots of different apps you can look at, too. Um, I have one on my phone called Breathe. I don't know if you guys have heard that or seen that. Breathe is one of them. I'm trying to think of the other one that I have on my phone. There's lots of them, though. Mm -hmm. But if you just look at meditation apps, and most of them are free. Mm -hmm. So you can just set it to remind you to do it at nighttime or in the morning. And if you can only do it for five minutes. Still, it's better than nothing. Exactly. Yeah. So. Well, just, in five minutes you know, a day for a month, if you do that as a habit, will eventually maybe potentially turn into a 30 minute, it, it, you know. It can, yes. That's the good thing about it. If you can kind of get yourself into the mode of doing it, then maybe you yeah. can get a little bit better at it as time goes on, you know. Yeah. But no, I've just noticed that just the acknowledgement of not having a problem, I won't use the word problem, because it's not a problem. It's just having the acknowledgement of the childhood that was not perfect and the trauma that was experienced and the realization that trauma is something that will be with you forever. And it made me realize it even more. I was actually watching TV last night. We were watching, um, what's the guy's name? It's on SNL. He's really young. He dated, um, Chris, uh, he dated, um, Adriana. They were engaged maybe. And then he was suicidal. He's a really young guy. He's on SNL. Anyway, he is bringing a movie. He's got a movie going up, coming out. And his father was a firefighter and he was killed in 9-11. Uh, okay. And y'all know who he is. I don't remember his name. But anyway, he's very well known. And last year, the year before, he went through a very dark time where he was just very close to killing himself. And people at SNL were really worried even on the show. Mm -hmm. um, I think he had been hospitalized and they were like talking to him on the show during that episode, during that weekend that that happened. And he said, he goes, you know, just the acknowledgement that I've had a traumatic childhood and it will never be, I'll never be the same. Mm -hmm. And there's a line that's drawn, like with everybody that has anything happen to them that's that traumatic, there's a life before that and a life after that. And their reactions to things like dad and, uh, crazy events that happen in our lives that we have no control over are different from other people that haven't experienced that because of the experience of having had that trauma. So there's a there's less of a reaction because we almost expect every day to have something bad go wrong or have something go wrong. Yeah. You know, there's it's not that we're negative. I'm not I don't consider myself to be a pessimist at all. No, you know me. Not. I'm very you're not positive. But um, I always think, okay, whenever something's going on I always have in the back of my head well what if this happened or this could this, this could happen and sometimes those are not rational thoughts you know they're not but you know I actually heard something on this the other day that kind of changed my perspective on that so there's something called law of attraction so if you're thinking bad thoughts then you're going to bring bad things in that's actually not accurate mm -mm. it's not accurate because there's so many people that worry on this planet and not all bad stuff happens every single day right I mean, if you're always focused on negative, then maybe your mindset is negative, but it doesn't mean that actual events are going to occur outside of your sphere that are that are negative. Or that you've caused them somehow to happen exactly. to yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the thing I heard the other day was, and I'm trying to think of how she actually put it. I would almost have to go find the video again. Um, Energetically, I think if you have a ton of people on the planet thinking one thing at one time, there's a possibility that that occurrence could happen. Right. But she is riding on an airplane, okay, okay. as All the right. example. Okay. And say you have, I don't know, 175 people on a plane. There are planes that hold bigger, some that hold smaller, but 175 is about the average yeah. flight, flights nowadays. If you had 160 of them, thinking of the same thing, oh my gosh, we're gonna crash. It could happen. But chances are those 160 people did not cause that to actually happen. Right. It was mechanical failure or something. Right. Um, I do believe though, that we can actually create things. I mean, I think that's why I try to stay positive most times. And I don't know if maybe that's why I don't worry about stuff like I used to. 
It's not like I don't think that something bad can happen. It's just if it does, it's just then you just deal with it and you get on with your day. Unless it's just so catastrophic that you do need to, you know, do some work around that trauma. But most things that happen on a daily basis are not that traumatic. No. They're just not. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, is growing up, I mean, to me it seemed like a lot of things were traumatic. When I look back now, I'm like, they just weren't. They weren't. They weren't. Yeah. And I always wondered if that was just some kind of trauma that I was dealing with, and that's maybe why I was reacting the way that I was, kind of like you were with your mom dying to her. Not that I had anything that bad happen, but... Well, it's just interesting, because I didn't think about it. I mean, intermittently, you think about it as you go through, you know, birthdays and different times and whatever, you think about stuff. But, you know, last year I thought about it a little bit because, you know, it was like, I don't know, Mother's Birthday. Mother's Day is always kind of an issue. Not an issue, but it's like I never got really to do the same things that the other kids got to do because everybody had a mother, right? They had a mother at Mother's Day, and then and then they did what they did on, you know, church, and they had the, the uh, white roses were the the corsages that people wore whose mothers had passed away and all these kids and the red roses is for your mom that's alive and so all my friends are walking around church and you know they're all wearing red corsages or red roses and you know I'm working in North Carolina so it's the old Southern Baptist Church and it's all traditional stuff and and I was the only kid that had this white flower you know and it just felt like I stuck out and it was always different because you know you go over to somebody's house to do a sleepover and mom their mom's there you know, and, and even though I had a stepmother, it wasn't the same relationship. So it just wasn't the same. And um, you don't realize that as you're little. I mean, you do, but you don't inter you internalize it differently. And then I think whenever I became a mom, I think one of the things that I've done to overcompensate is obviously the type of house we've got and me trying to paint the walls just perfect, whatever the kids wanted and create this environment that's just like Willy Wonka almost for them to live in because um, I want it to be a childhood that they just cherish and remember and there's no bad vibes at all, you know. And as you all know, you can do that all you want to. You're still going to have, you're still going to have familial stuff come up. There's still going to be teenagers that turn, children that turn into teenagers and yeah. there's still going to be drama. It doesn't matter what you do as a parent, there's always going to be something that comes up that's just out of your control which brings me back and us back to the other conversation we started with, which is knowing when to react mm -hmm. and when to just let it go and just know it's just part of life happening and it's not worth getting all bent out of shape and getting some gray hairs over it. And, no. Or probably in my case... Gray hairs are just signs of wisdom, that's all. Well, yeah, but you know, or my, you know, like in my case, when the doctor said I'd had all these heart attacks, I thought back and I'm like, when? And I'm like, I know, I know when. I had it whenever this happened. I had yeah. it whenever that happened. Yeah, I could probably you just kept on. I just, just kept, kept on, on moving. moving. That's what you did. I just kept on going right through it, not worried about it. But it's crazy. So I have to tell you something. When you started talking about your mom, yeah, and I don't know if it got picked up on the camera, but there was a dragonfly sitting on your chair right behind you. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked about that. We talked yeah. about a lot about that. And um, and I was in North Carolina probably last fall and I was hanging out visiting with some of my friends um, on Brian's mama's porch mm -hmm. and the frogs were just going crazy. They were just chir chirping, 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 mm -hmm. chirping, chirping. And us girls started talking about Nana, my grandmother. And mm -hmm. um, I talk a lot about Nana. I talk a lot about Nana in the kitchen. I talk a lot about Nana in the garden. In fact, you saw... You, you talked to me a lot about I Nana. I know, you know, and, and you know, it's she was very important. Granny and Big Daddy were too. All my grandparents were just very important um, to me growing up and were a big part of my childhood. They really stepped up and stepped in and were, were almost like parents to us, mm -hmm. specifically to me more than I think even Walter and Elizabeth. But I was talking about Nana and all of a sudden, and Joe said, uh oh, the frogs stopped chirping. And for a full minute, mm -hmm. nobody made a sound. It was just dead quiet. And Marty and Amy Jo were on the porch and they were freaking out. They were like, oh my God, oh my God, Nana's here, Nana's here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, I, there's not a day that goes by that I'm not out there in that garden and there's not this gorgeous butterfly that mm -hmm. wants to come and land really close, if not on me, mm -hmm. or a dragonfly, or, you know, and I pay attention to that just like you do. You know, it's, Let's say your chakras are already open. That's your meditation. 
I think that is our meditation. Yeah. When we're connecting with everything outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I really feel like that garden has been a whole portal. Mm -hmm. I should say a portal because it's a portal. I mean, it's almost like when you go out there and you start digging, you can almost hear them. Yep. You know, whispering to you. I even I wrote that on my on my Instagram uh, yesterday. I was digging around in the pictures and working on doing the family tree that I've you know been putting off forever because there's always something else that comes up. And I found a picture of my great grandfather, which was Nana's daddy, mm -hmm. on the farm in Virginia, and you know holding a hoe and then pair of overalls with a pipe hanging out of his mouth. And I thought to myself, boy, it would be cool to have known you, but I know you know me, mm -hmm. and I know that you're out there with me while I'm pulling corn and planting tomatoes and babysitting potatoes and doing all the stuff that I'm doing in the garden. It's just, it's what he did and what they did and he never knew me. Um, but but we're all connected in that way. Yeah. Which is, We don't have to know our ancestors to actually have that ancestral line come down. We it's don't. Cool. It's very cool. So, And it's very comforting too, mm -hmm. you know. I told you about the N95 masks. I talked, I talked a little bit about that on one of the other episodes. Did I tell mm -hmm. you about that? I don't remember. No, Nana and, and uh, I won't talk about it long because we've already done it, but Nana and Daddy came to me in a dream right, right as soon as all this stuff hit with the COVID stuff. And um, she said to me, just like she was talking to me. You did tell I did me. Tell you, yeah. you did tell me that you found them up in the cabinet yeah, and you right don't there remember them. We never bought them. So yeah. we just feel like Nana brought them to us. That's right. I do remember but that. I love know, that story. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that would say, oh, I don't believe in this and I don't believe in that. But you can't deny six N95 masks. No, that's not just something nowhere. random that just pops up in one's home. <laughs> <laughs> And occasionally, you know, the cat will be sitting in my lap and, you know, he'll just perk up real big and look and stare into the hallway, but not a stare that he's angry or upset or hissing. He's just clearly acknowledging that there's something moving around in that hallway that we can't see. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's, there's family members hanging out here, whether, but I will, I'm going to say there's family members hanging out here. They have to be because mm -hmm. there's not any other reason for anybody else to be hanging here mm -hmm. and with all the stuff going on in this house I don't know why anybody that wasn't a family member would want to stick around <laughs> right he wants to stick around with somebody else's crazy family and all the stuff they're doing in their house but you know, it's crazy but now what have you had happen to you that's made you feel like you were closer to to those that are not here anymore like my family mm -hmm. so with my dad's mom um, I would go sit over there with her on the weekends whenever I could get off the work and we would talk about painting and life events and just a bunch of different stuff. My grandmother was actually really well versed in a lot of different things. Um, actually, I thought the most interesting thing about my dad's mom though was the fact that she was a painter, but she did not start until she was about 40 or 41 years old because she had eight children and she was busy, a little busy. Um, I look back at her earlier work now and never saw it until she passed away about two years ago. And I've always been interested in painting, but never felt like I would be as good as her. So if you can't do something perfect, why even start? Yeah, because we all get taught that lesson. Yeah, so I did start kind of dabbling in painting a little while, a couple of years ago. But when she passed away, I went to her house to go look through everything because they were having an estate sale and my aunts had told me that I could actually have some paintings of hers and I saw one of her original works and I thought to myself, wow, she started about the same place that I'm starting at. So with her, I feel that lineage of just painting is like within her blood, within mine, that it's doable. So that that's what I feel from my grandmother. and. Just even now, like, if she's, she's obviously gone, but if I'm sitting there painting with somebody or if I'm doing anything art related, I can almost go into what we were talking about earlier, meditative state. Painting is very meditative. It really me. is. Yeah. Because you're not thinking about anything other than what you're doing in that moment. And it's just usually peaceful and it's just really beautiful. So, yeah. I thought about maybe taking an easel and sticking it out there in that garden and starting to paint some of those eggplants. And it's not like Monet out there in the garden with the lilies, though. but I think it'd be kind of cool to do that. Just roll that big old 
a huge wooden easel out there and park it maybe on an afternoon in the fall when it's not so hot in Texas, it's yeah. so hot right now. But, you know, I didn't tell you, but I found an old uh, painting, or not a painting, an old drawing on the back of a fee uh, receipt that was my great-grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, not my great-grandfather, it was my grandfather, it was Daddy's father, mm -hmm. Nana's husband. And Nana didn't paint, but my mother did and my daddy did. And so I've got in the house several paintings that both of them did. And it's kind of cool because they didn't spend a lot of time doing it. It was one of those things that they did just a little bit. You know, they never yeah. really did it like every week or anything like that. But they did do it. And I remember daddy would always buy art supplies and want to paint. And then he'd get back to busy delivering babies and seeing mm -hmm. patients and tending to children. And he never did sit down and do all of the paintings that he planned to do. But when he painted, he always painted ducks. Yeah. and sceneries and flowers and still lifes and stuff like that so and he always thought it was funny because i always paint naked pregnant naked women or naked women or not always naked women for sure yeah sometimes pregnant but most of the time non-pregnant and of course mm -hmm. photographing pregnant naked women so i've really been always enamored with like the anatomy and and i don't know if i told you but my first art show was at saint mary's in 1990 as a high school yeah as a high school student i was at, it was in raleigh it's a private episcopal boarding school the, the only one left in the country and they let me do my own thing right so I have these paintings that I'm supposed to do for my art show for the senior show and nobody really except the art teacher she knew what was going on um, didn't really talk about what I was going to be debuting at the art show and so me and one other student had these we had the whole library and the library at St. Mary's is like open in the top floor with all glass and it's lit up at night and you can see everything from the entire campus and I remember going up there and doing the installation and I had done a whole bunch of boobs and <laughs> naked men and naked women and I did the installation and Mr. Tate, he's been dead forever now, but he was my uh, British lit professor and he was from England and he just cracked up because you know here's this conservative right. uh boarding school for you know episcopal <laughs> girls and nobody said a word and then all of a sudden i show up with all these huge like 30 by 40 naked people paintings and he pranced across the back mm -hmm. of that hall of that library and kind of kicked up as he pranced and he was like oh miss evans oh my goodness what can of worms you've opened up with your art show mm -hmm. and i thought it was so funny i mean they should have expected it from me i mean anybody could have gone upstairs to the art department and seen what i was working on the whole entire semester but but nobody did which was funny but i've always tried to be a little controversial i wasn't trying to be controversial but I, it, but it was what you i liked. was painting what i liked and yes. but it was really funny because it really did sort of spark a whole new uh-oh, uh we got to make a new game plan here. We can't just let these artists <laughs> just paint whatever they want to paint because we don't know where they're going to go. <laughs> we don't know what we're going to have to deal with with the parents and answer it for the, for the faculty because it was, you know, very, very conservative there. So it's funny. Really, really, really funny. But anyway, well, you know, all of our grandmothers, we talked about it earlier too, they're, they're both fire pistols, which was really wonderful to have that spunk and that fire. You said at the very end of her life, she was really... Uh, a lot more uh, fiery than you even realized that she was. She when was. It came out. She was. Both of my grandmothers were actually. Why do you think that happened? Just because they knew they were getting ready to be done and they wanted to have their I last don't know. Trial. I don't know, especially with my mom's mom. I again, she was just really quiet and didn't say a lot. I mean, that was the first. That's the that is the statement that my father makes about my grandmother all the time. She never complained. She never had anything to say. She was always so quiet. She was the perfect mother-in-law. Wow. And she really was. And she still was to the end. But I just remember her in the nursing home and either talking to me or talking to my mom or talking to my aunt. We just saw a little bit of a different side of her at the end. It was as if she was speaking up for herself, which was really awesome, I thought. Yeah, so, yeah. At 103, almost 103 That's before so cool. she passed away. That's so cool. Nana was 102 when she passed away, and I don't know if you remember me telling you whenever she came here, you know, I got her on the airplane and she broke, yeah. in, she broke in hip, she fell out of the, the porch before Brian and I got married, and, and she was on a walker, and, and she got ready to go to the church for the reception, for the rehearsal and everything, and she tossed that walker aside and told my brother, <laughs> which she called him Walter David, she calls all of us by our double names, and she said, Walter David, come help me. 
and he was like, everybody was like clamoring, trying to figure out what to do because they knew you couldn't argue with her. Like when she made something, the decision, that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she did. She walked down that aisle, and and then they had to they had to do a colonoscopy thing where they went in, not a colonoscopy, where they removed part of her colon, yeah. and they put a bag on her. And she about five years after that, so now we're talking about mid nineties. She nice. announced that she was having that removed and put back. She said it was her albatross and that she was not about to have that happen. She needed to have that bag taken off and be put back together again. And everybody was like, oh my God, you're gonna die on the table. Nobody does this reversal mid nineties. And Nana was like, um, I don't care if I die on that table. I'm not gonna live like this. And so sure enough, she did. But the funniest thing was, Daddy said that whenever he went in to check on her, he, he found the orthopedic surgeon which was a, a friend of our family, giving her a pedicure at the hospital. <laughs> and she had basically kind of uh, pulled her aside. I guess she came by to say hey to her or whatever, and she pulled her aside and she was like, uh, hey, my toenails need to be done. And the nurses were like aghast because, you know, mm -hmm. here's this patient. But they knew it was Dr. Evans's mom, but still it was just funny to see a doctor just completely not even think a thing about it and just go into being a human being and a kind friend and and doing her toenails and not not what she was there to do which was round and see patients you know yeah it's just funny so but anyway i love those old ladies i love them whenever they get to be to the point where they don't care what other people think exactly that's the best part of all if you can get to there that puts us back to the chakras if you're just doing this yeah, and you're like, okay, I'm open to the universe. I'm going to be who I'm going to be. I'm going to say what I need to say, and I'm not going to worry about hurting people's feelings because you're not meaning to hurt their feelings anyway. Yeah. You're just being honest. Um, it makes life a whole lot better. It does. It makes it sweet. It does. I hope you guys. Thank you for being here, Erin. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. I hope that you guys have enjoyed hanging out with us this afternoon and and uh, getting a little glimpse into what our friendship's like and, and our martini talks with our water today in the hot Texas sun. And I hope you guys will uh, will enjoy other future episodes. I hope that Errol will come back and visit us again. Hopefully I will. she will. I will. And I um, hope you guys are living your sweet life and we'll see you next week. Take care, bye-bye.